Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're here at the uh, ashram of uh, <coughs> Gupta Govardhan in Chiang Mai, Thailand, courtesy of Theistic Media Studios, and broadcasting over live stream, live stream, to uh, all our friends out there. We know we have friends in Tomsk, Siberia, we have friends in the United States of America. We have some friends in Ireland and different parts of the world, including Mexico, Ukraine, France, Germany, England. So thank you for joining us this evening. But before we do, I'd like to say a few words about the search for Sri Krishna, reality of the beautiful. It was about 30 years ago that we originally published this book, um, <clears throat> working together with uh, Bhakti Siddhir Goswami Maharaj in uh, San Jose, California. Uh, the first, our first printing was in 1983, so it's actually been 31 years. And we, we printed five, we printed 10,000 copies. And since then, this book has never gone out of print. Uh, that's a great testimony to the words and wisdom of my guru, Bhakti Rakshak Sri Dardev Goswami. And we organized this book in a special way to take care of a lot of different doubts. We, we started with the idea that Krishna consciousness really talks about love and beauty. Those are our two principal points. We're not pushing a religion on people. We're not trying to get you to uh, change your religious point of view. You can continue on with your nationality, your religion, your family. We're not asking you to leave your family. We're asking you to consider that Krishna consciousness represents a superior form of uh, love and beauty. Krishna is beauty. Right? But this is given in a general way in the beginning of the book. And then gradually we try to deal with the different doubts that people might have. For example, uh, where is this coming from? So what saints, scriptures, and gurus give us? What do the scientists have to say? Um, oftentimes we follow intelligence and reason to the point where we doubt our own soul. We doubt our own existence. And um, how is this knowledge? How can the scientists help us if their conclusion is that there's nothing more than space and time and atoms in the void? So what would be the paradigm for a subjective evolution of consciousness as opposed to material evolution? And that leads into a discussion about the origin of the soul. Where do we come from? Where are we going after that? Knowledge above mortality. What's real knowledge? <clears throat> and different philosophies of India. Because it's interesting, if you look at Western philosophers and how their particular point of view gets repeated in different shapes and forms in uh, the sayings that are voiced every day on Facebook, um, you'll find it's interesting. Trace these sayings back and you'll find there's a philosopher there. Uh, Strangely, these philosophies were all talked about thousands of years ago. Perhaps because in those days people didn't have television. They had something better to think about. So they thought about the origin of life. Who are we? Where are we going? And also posited ideas like atoms in the void or uh, nihilism. All these things are ancient philosophies of India. And that's talked about in this book, Sri Guru and His Grace. And then, of course, that's very remote. Most people believe today in you know, Islam or Christianity. So how can we go beyond the ordinary mundane view of Christianity that most people entertain? What are the different levels of God realization? And how does that take us to the Krishna conception? The followers of uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we like the holy name of Krishna. So what is the appropriate understanding about the Hare Krishna mantra. And then, exactly, what do we mean by reality of the beautiful? The book ends with the conversation between Ramananda Roy and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, I'm 
I'm very happy to see that 30 years later, our book is still in print and it's still being read. Not only is it still in print, but it has been translated into many different languages. Uh, I'm meeting with many of our Russian friends and finding that just recently, our books have entered uh, the mainstream of thought in Russia and the Ukraine, and that uh, groups of people are gathering and discussing the search for Sri Krishna and its meaning. And I was fortunate enough this year to be invited to Kiev in the Ukraine, where we had a Veda Life festival where thousands of young people were practicing yoga and uh, playing transcendental music and attending our lectures and thinking about the message of the search for Sri Krishna. And this took place also in Moscow and St. Petersburg and was such a great success that they invited me back in December for Christmas. And so I traveled through the snows of uh, Kiev and Ukraine and uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg to meet with uh, thousands of people who were fascinated with uh, the search for Sri Krishna. And this very much surprised me because I felt that uh, years after we published the books, I felt that perhaps the, uh, our message was not really going to be taken so seriously by the consumer uh, culture that we live in. Because people are more fascinated with sex, drugs, rock and roll, money, and really don't have time for contemplating new spiritual ideas. I was very surprised and pleased when the Russian devotees invited me to uh, visit Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then again, now here I am in, in Thailand, and again, we're reflecting on the same book. I hope to leave in a couple of weeks. We're going to uh, an ancient holy place called Angkor Wat, where they have the largest Vishnu temple in the world. And we have a, a movie that we're shooting there. And I'm working very hard on the script, making last minute changes, uh, trying to get everything ready to go before next week, before we get on an airplane and go to Chang, uh, we go to Angkor Wat and begin filming. So uh, this has been a great adventure for me the last few weeks, uh, being invited to so many places and getting a chance to speak with so many people. And I, I want to personally thank all the great folks in Russia who made it possible, especially Avadut Maharaj and Goswami Maharaj, uh, who was my friend. We published the book together, but we have many uh, very dedicated uh, devotees who have chosen a monastic way of life and are trying to uh, contemplate the, the inner meaning of the search for Sri Krishna. So I'm very pleased that uh, I've been given a chance to speak and I hope that maybe we have some questions today. We are very fortunate that we can have those great books, but it seems that we are not as enthusiastic to distribute the books as the ISKCONs. So why it is that? Um, it, that's an interesting choice of words. And because I'm a writer, I think about words all the time. So the word enthusiasm is interesting. It comes from theos, which means God. Enthusiastic means uh, filled with God. So I don't really, sincerely, I don't believe that uh, our circle of friends is less God-inspired than any other circle of friends. Uh, what I see is big festivals in Ukraine, big festivals in Russia, uh, very well-organized mission here in uh, Thailand. So from, from what I'm seeing recently, I'm seeing uh, a lot of very young, very enthusiastic uh, people working hard to pursue the Krishna dream, to make it real. And um, I don't know, where's this question coming from? Can you tell me that? Do we know? From one of the viewers. Oh. It's a relative question. It has to do with uh, different people, different actors, a different cast of characters, if you like. So um, just as every metabolism is a bit different, and the doctor can give you aspirin and can give you aspirin, but maybe it has a slightly different effect on different people, you know. So by the same token, we see different 
currents of Krishna consciousness manifest in different places. And sometimes we see greater enthusiasm here and sometimes we see greater enthusiasm there. The important thing is to try to maintain the current. Uh, sometimes also enthusiasm um, and fanaticism are not far apart. Uh, if I am out in the street uh, standing on a box telling everyone who passes by that the end of the world is coming, I may not really genuinely uh, be enlightened. I may be merely a victim of uh, fanaticism. So mm, that, that may also be taken into consideration. I can't speak to other groups of people and how enthusiastic they are. What I'm seeing here is very enthusiastic. I see happy, shining faces, smiling, dancing, chanting Hare Krishna, uh, distributing Krishna Prasadam. Uh, although recently, uh, because of circumstances beyond our control, having to do with uh, some political problems, we're, we, we were not allowed to continue the, uh, the street kirtan. And I think the devotees really enjoyed the street kirtan, so perhaps something could be done about that. Hmm? Next question. That there are many, a lot of Vedic traditions, so which one in your opinion is like, uh, would be useful to receive nowadays in, for the modern world? Well, you know, Vedic traditions really, if, if you think about the word Vedic, very uh, Scientifically, it refers to the time before the Mahabharat period. After that, then there's the Puranas and the Itihasa, <coughs> like uh, there's the Mahabharat, there's the uh, Ramayan, there's 18 different Puranas, of which the Vishnu Purana, the uh, Bhagavat Purana, of course, or Padma Purana, these are referred to by Rupa Goswami. So, in terms of what's Vedic, really, we're more concerned with the tradition that was interpreted and uh, commented on by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu start, starting in around the, the 15th century. So, that would be particular attention paid to the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam or the Bhagavat Purana. And the meaning of that can be found in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. We like the, we like the commentary of the Bhagavad Gita that was originally written by Sridhar Maharaj, Sridhar Swami, I mean. Right? The original commentary is the Sridhar Swami commentary, but we also like Sridhar Maharaj's commentary. So from Sridhar to Sridhar. There's the tradition of commentary in the Bhagavad Gita that begins with Sridhar Swami, Madhvacharya, running through... Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada and Sridhar Maharaj that gives a very deep interpretation of the Gita Upanishad. Now, the Bhagavad Gita comes out of the Mahabharata, but it's considered Upanishadic by the, the nature of its discourse. So, if you really want something Upanishadic or Vedic, uh, read the Bhagavad Gita. You know? If you're interested in understanding more about our particular tradition, then you can start with the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and, but you can also try to read this book, The Search for Sri Krishna. I recommend it. Yeah, what else? Thank you. Any more questions? More questions? Yes. Um, hmm. <coughs> it said that many of the appearances of Krishna is on the full moon. Who is this moon present? Who is this moon personality, and what role does he or she play in the Lord's pastimes? Well, we were talking about the gods the other day, Indra, Vayu. Indra is the god of rain, the god of thunder, Vayu, the god of wind, uh, Chandra is the god of the moon. In our, on our trip to Angor, 
we'll see some of this uh, represented on the walls of the bas reliefs. For example, the churning of the ocean of milk by the gods and demons. Uh, there you see Vasuki, the 82, 88 Devatas, 92 Asuras, Raku, Ketu, all these different personalities. Um, are we to think in the 21st century that uh, the moon god is a, a genuine personality and that we should have some transaction with him? Well, this is an interesting question. The moon god, according to uh, Vedic uh, literature, is Chandra. Chandra. And uh, Krishna is actually born into the dynasty that comes from the moon, whereas uh, Ram is born into the dynasty that comes from the sun, the Brigus. There's the Vrishni and the Chandra dynasty, and then there's the Surya dynasty. So Ram is coming in the Surya dynasty from the, from the sun. You know, but to assign particular personalities to the sun and the moon and say that the sun is Surya and he rides in a chariot early in the morning, we may uh, take uh, a more ontological view of these uh, stories and think, well, what does that represent? What does the, <clears throat> what do we mean by the moon god? Uh, what do we mean by the god of the rain? And there's basically two different avenues that you can take. First of all, you have to remember that the sun and the moon, they're part of this material world. We're not talking about transcendental uh, reality. We're talking about mundane reality. So the sun can be observed through telescopes now and space probes, and so can the moon. We've landed on the moon. We've taken probes from the moon. We brought, brought moon dust back from the moon to the earth. What a terrible thing. I was talking to Sridhar Marsh about this one time, and he said, what a terrible thing that these scientists or astronauts have destroyed the poetry of the moon. We like to think of the moon as a transcendental place, as a spiritual place, a spiritual light that appears in the night and gives us uh, a cooling effect. It brings out the aroma of the jasmine. If you have any ja jasmine near your house, you can smell the fragrance at night because the moon draws the sap up from the plant. Uh, but are we really to think that the moon is, is uh, a transcendental light occupied by a god and not uh, a big rock orbiting the, the earth? Well, the scientists have pretty much refuted the idea that the moon is a transcendental person who lives there and rides a chariot, just, or the sun rides a chariot early in the morning. We can see. The, the sun is some sort of uh, fusion reactor producing incredible amount of power. <clears throat> so how are we to interpret the sayings of the Puranas <clears throat> in that light? <clears throat> in the Gayatri Mantra, it says, Om Bhur Bhuva Savitur Varenya. It talks about the light. Well, nominally, the Gayatri Mantra asks us to meditate on the sun. We do, we're supposed to do it three times a day, when the sun rises, when it's uh, at its apogee, and when it's on the horizon again. <coughs> so, it may be taken, well, this is a meditation on the sun, Savitur. You know, that which shines, that brilliant thing. But, uh, in his explanation, Sri Dharmarsh explained, this is not a reference to the sun, it's a, reference, it's a reference to the light that illuminates the universe. And what is that? It's the soul. It's the jiva, the jivatma. Or if you like, you can think of it also as the paramatma. Or in other words, it's the spiritual consciousness and the supreme spiritual consciousness within this universe that, illum that illuminates it, not some ball of fire in the sky. It's not a material place. It's a plane of consciousness. So... In the same way, we can reflect on, on moonlight and think, well, that light that shines in darkness, what is that? How does it illuminate me? What does it represent? 
And ultimately we come to the idea of the jivatma, the soul. The soul illuminates the universe. Particularly the soul because we've explained in some previous lectures that the universe is kind of a projection, sort of a projection that's made by an infinite number of souls and paramatma, who reinforces the uh, projection. It's not an absolute reality in, in the hard sense that a uh, circle is always 360 degrees. Uh, it's, it, it's reality in the sense that when matter is uh, infused with uh, consciousness, and that consciousness empowers matter, uh, then we all believe in the same uh, mass hypnosis and the same illusion. And that illusion takes on a quality very much like uh, reality. But without the soul, if there's no soul in the universe, if there's no consciousness <clears throat> driving material reality, if, then there's no real light. And, and uh, so there's no reality. What exactly the moon represents, normally the moon is romantic, you know. It, it represents that power in the sky that, that moves the water that has an effect on women, you know, it, it raises the sap in the flowers, it affects our, uh, our seasons, how we plant. So in India today, they still use the lunar calendar to calculate uh, when it's a good time to plant. And um, it works fine in a nation of 900 million souls. So the moon has a particular significance, the sun also. <clears throat> and then you can think, well, okay, so what you're saying is this is mythology, right? Uh, Carl Jung has an interesting uh, analysis of uh, mythology that was later taken up by Joseph uh, Campbell. And that was written about by this writer named Christopher uh, Vogel, who wrote a book called Writer's Journey. It's a really good book about how to understand uh, story. But what Carl Jung says is he says there's a thing called the uh, collective unconsciousness. And that means if you dream of a dragon, and you dream of a dragon, and I dream of a dragon, and you dream of a dragon, um, maybe there's something to that. Where is that dream reality coming from? Perhaps we're connecting with a particular plane of consciousness, a particular subtle uh, world or channel where there is something like a dragon. And if it's only dreamt about by you and you and me, that's one thing. But what if it's dreamt about by everybody in Russia, everybody in China, all the people in Asia, all the people in <coughs> the Americas <coughs> for generations and generations and thousands of years? And you see in the temples of Mexico, there's dragons. And in the temples of China, uh, carved into the rock wall thousands of years ago. There's a dragon and an Angkor Wat uh, built thousands of years ago. There's a dragon. So where does that dragon come from? Is it an absolute mythology in the sense that it's completely unrealistic? Or is there something in the subtle world that suggests something like dragons to everyone? Well, if everyone has the same experience in the world of subtle unconsciousness, the collective unconsciousness, isn't that a kind of reality? So we look at a, a mythological reality and we think, oh, well, that can never be. But if you look at it from another point of view, it may be that this is something very real that is permanent in the, in the human psyche. So where is it coming from? Uh, is that not also coming from some kind of reality? Perhaps it's a, a more subtle reality. You know, we're not entirely familiar with it. But the idea of a sun god, it's permanent in all human traditions since the dawn of time. The idea of a moon god, right? So perhaps <clears throat> the moon is a symbol for something. Perhaps it stands for something. Perhaps there's <clears throat> a form of energy or a plane of consciousness that is illustrated by the moon or that the moon suggests and that that moves us and we see something like a moon god. That's the best answer I can give on that. And uh, we 
got a message from Dhananjaya Prabhu. Dhananjaya, he's, yeah. he's a regular, regular listener. It's good to hear from you, Dhananjaya. Thank you. He said, Dhanavat Mahayogi Prabhu, please <coughs> tell us what is Paramahansa vision and how can we get such vision? Okay. Paramahansa vision, <coughs> the word Paramahansa is interesting. It means a swan like person. Right? The word is hangsa, and param means supreme, supreme swan. But it means a swan-like person. So you think about what a swan is. Have you ever seen a swan? Go, go to you know, a place, a nice pond somewhere, and observe the swan. Right? The swan is very graceful. It's the epitome of grace. It, it moves through the water but you cannot understand, how is, how is it moving? It doesn't make any movement. Its neck is held erect, its head in, in a perfect position, and it doesn't really move its head. It's gracefully moving through the water. So, a swan-like person is someone who, get, who can gracefully move through the current of this material world without being disturbed. Uh, <coughs> A good example of a swan-like person is uh, Govinda Maharaj, or uh, Sridhar Maharaj, or Prabhupada, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have lozenges, throat lozenges. I'm just going to keep cl clearing my throat. <coughs> now, what's the quality? If you think about the one quality that makes a swan-like soul, uh, like Haridash Thakur, he was whipped through, I forget how many markets, 20 different markets in, in Bengal. From market to market, he was whipped for chanting Hare Krishna. Why? He was a Muslim. A Muslim, in those days, you know, they didn't particularly like it if someone was converted to Islam, from Islam to uh, Vaishnavism. They took it as a personal insult to their faith. So they had to show everyone we're going to whip this man. Don't do that. Don't chant Hare Krishna. We're going to whip you through so many markets. But Haridas Thakur didn't become angry. He didn't curse the people who were whipping him. He just kept chanting Hare Krishna. Trinada pi sunichena, torora pi sahishnuna, amanida manadena, kirtaniya sada hari. If you want to be capable of constantly taking the holy name, learn from Haridas Thakur, learn from his example. What's his example? He's like bamboo. Bamboo is very beautiful, right? The example is given of grass and a tree. Humbler than the grass, more tolerant than a tree. Well, bamboo is both grass and tree. It's kind of interesting. And in a hurricane, the bamboo will bend all the way over. And later on, it comes back to its ordinary position. So. You can hack at the bamboo with a machete, but it's strong. It, the machete will bounce off. <clears throat> so meditate on bamboo. Think about how does the bamboo bend in, in the hurricane wind? And how does it tolerate everything? You know, how, how can I be humble? How can I tolerate? A good way to <clears throat> move in this direction is try to lose your anger. Anger is a very uh, dangerous, uh, very powerful feeling. And sometimes the devotees indulge in anger because they think, well, <clears throat> if I'm being angry for my guru, it's okay. My guru tells me, uh, don't let anybody in at the gate. And somebody tries to come in at the gate, and I hold them back, and I'm angry, and I defend them up. All right, he, there's a point to be made for that. Right? But in a normal situation, anger is not good. In a normal situation, <clears throat> a swan-like soul avoids anger. Now, it's a curious point. How do you avoid anger? And the other point is, what is real humility? Right? Or real tolerance? Real tolerance does not mean that I, I sit in the temple and meditate. Uh, real tolerance means that if I'm walking in the market and somebody insults me, then I'm not offended. If I'm at the airport going through the security 
and um, they reach inside my pockets, they, they uh, make me take off my shoes, they insult me and say things. I'm not offended. I don't take that personally. So the point is, if you're humble in the face of provocation, then that's real humility. If you're humble when there's no provocation, that's not really, you know, so laudable. It's not, that's not going to go in the newspaper, you know. If you're faithful and chaste, right, and avoid, uh, you know, if you're, if you're faithful, right, that means you're faithful when there's temptation, right? It's one thing to say, well, I'm a very faithful person, but when there's a challenge to your faith or when temptation comes, can you be strong? You know, that's the mark of somebody who's balanced, who understands how to move through the water like a swan, right? So the swan-like person does not become angry. Now, how can you avoid anger? You can avoid anger by not taking things personally. If somebody insults you, you can think, they don't know me. They're not my family. I'm not. That's why, that's why when your family insults you, it's, it's really difficult to tolerate because they know you. They know who you are. But if it's someone you don't know, well, you don't have to take that personally. I don't know you. You're not really insulting me because you don't know me. Hmm? So it's important not to take things personally. Another point is compassion, love. We talk about love of Krishna all the time, but you cannot have love of Krishna if you hate everybody else. You, I hate the meat eaters. I hate the karmi demons. I hate the non-devotees. You know, that's not a good mentality, right? If I say, well, I, I hate everybody who doesn't belong to my religion. This is not a swan-like personality. Prabhupada was not like that. Hmm? Mahaprabhu was not like that, right? Govinda Maharaj was not like that. Govinda Maharaj said, I don't care what rascaldom somebody is doing as long as they are loyal, as long as they're doing some service, as long as they're faithful. It doesn't bother me. I don't look at them and judge them and think, this man is bad, he's wrong, I condemn him. Hmm? We can forgive all sins. Right? So, avoiding judge, judgment of other people will help you to control your anger. And another point is compassion. So, love means it. it I, it's not that I, I, I love the deity in the temple and I, I can't stand anybody else. Love means I have to love other human beings. That's very difficult. It's easy to love plants. I really love plants because, you know, I can cut them, I can pull the flowers out, I can give them to somebody else. They're not going to complain, right? My plants, so I think, well, my plants love me. They don't complain. Or if you have a dog, your dog loves you. He, he'll do whatever you want. He's your slave. So it's easy to love your dog if your dog is your slave. You know? Or your cat, although cats are more independent. But to love other human beings, that's difficult. How do you get the Russians to love the Ukrainians? You know? How do you get the Ukrainians to love the Russians? The Americans hate the Russians. The Russians hate the Americans. How do you get the Americans to love the, the Russians? That, that's more difficult. I don't understand why. You know? It doesn't make any sense. It should be, properly, it should be easier for you to love other human beings than to love plants, 
right? But one of the keys to that is compassion, <clears throat> which means <clears throat> if I see how this man is suffering, I don't want to steal his money. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to take anything from him. He's suffering. This principle comes really from Buddha, but it, it's also in our tradition. If I can see the suffering of other souls, then I won't want to exploit them. I don't want to cause them more suffering. So through compassion, we avoid anger. I'm going through the security check and the man wants to make my life, I'm going to the immigration office, the man wants to make my life difficult, right? But I look at that man and I think, he, he, he hates his job so much. His feet hurt, his shoes are tight. He's old, he has a bad liver. This man is suffering. I don't want to cause him more suffering by being angry. Now, these are, what I'm telling you, these are sort of like rational things that you can do or little tricks to help you avoid anger. But a swan-like soul, he's equipoised on the water. He moves through the water without cause, causing even a ripple, right? Because he's balanced. And the real basis for that balance is divine love. Bhakti. So we're practitioners. We're trying to get there. We want to be like that swan-like soul. How can we do that? Well, we practice. We discuss these things. You know, think about it. Try to do some service to a higher soul, and observe this higher soul. See how he acts. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. I spoke a long time on that point, but this is something I've been thinking about a lot. That's why. I, I'm speaking on that. Because I'm trying to understand how to control anger. I, you know, sometimes get affected. And uh, what else? <clears throat> I'm sorry, I spoke for a long time on that, but I'm, I'm thinking about this problem of anger. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, what was the life like at the mud back in time? When there were when there were not so many Westerners, were the schedule of the day prashadam or mood different? <clears throat> the average life in well, I joined the Los Angeles Temple in 1976. Okay, <clears throat> the average life was like this. Um, I lived in the Brahmachari Ashram, okay, which was the the temple room floor. We woke up at. Four o'clock in the morning, some people earlier, right, <clears throat> rolled up our sleeping bag and put it in the box. And then we, we mopped and cleaned the floor because that's the temple room and got ready for the RT. The RT was at 4.30. The Pujari did the RT at 4.30. So the space that we had it was like this space, right? <clears throat> They'd open the doors and do the... Uh, the puja, that would go till about five o'clock. And then at five o'clock or so, <clears throat> we would have the Bhagavatam class. At this time, Prabhupada was translating the Bhagavatam. And we would listen to the latest translations. And the expert, the expert devotee, the temple president, or maybe somebody was visiting, would give the class. And that went to about 6 o'clock. <clears throat> At 6 o'clock, we had to uh, chant our Hare Krishna japa on our rosaries, right? Our japa beads, 16 rounds, right? So you had till about 8 o'clock to finish that. And at 8.30, we had prasadam. Prasadam meant you, there was a, a sheet like that of wax paper. Wax paper, you know what that is? Like freezer paper. Mm -hmm. Then 
the, the uh, server would come and you would get um, this much oatmeal, hot oatmeal, right? You'd get a slice of ginger root, s slice of ginger root, 12 garbanzo beans, and a drink. I forget, I, I forget what the drink was. I think it was probably water, right? And that you'd finish taking prasadam around 8.30. At uh, <clears throat> 9 o'clock, for us, uh, book distributors, we would find our, uh, the clothes that we could wear outside the temple and drive to a spot <clears throat> and try to sell books. The temple devotees would stay in the temple and do the, you know, bogar. They'd cook, clean, do the bogar tea. You know, our temple president handled phone calls and organized things. And in the afternoon, we came home. At around 4 o'clock or 4.30, we could uh, maybe have prasadam again. And then the evening arti was at 6 o'clock. After that, we had the Bhagavad Gita class. And after that, we had hot milk and Krishna book. That was the routine. Uh, you know, might be different according to holy, you know, festivals, Sunday feasts, things like that. And according to your service, you know, uh, when I was in the Los Angeles temple in the beginning, uh, <clears throat> every day at around 10 o'clock, we'd get in a car or a truck, and we'd go to downtown Los Angeles. And there we would, uh, we would be wearing our dhotis, and we would do Nagar Kirtan for like three hours. And I would jump, I was so happy, I would jump up and down until my feet hurt. My feet hurt so bad at the end of the day, I would have to soak them in hot water because I was jumping up and down and chanting Hare Krishna very enthusiastically. I really loved I really loved the whole Hari Na. And that was basically what our day was like. So, you know, we did our best to celebrate the holy name of Krishna, distribute prasadam, distribute books, you know, follow Prabhupada's instructions. Yeah, another question? Uh, in some of Srila Goswami Maharaj lectures, I've heard the name Ishtadeva. Ishtadev. Ishtadev. Can I don't know him. Uh, Sorry, no. I don't know Ishtadev. Oh. Who was he? I don't know. Tell me about Ishtadev. Next <laughs> week, stay tuned. We'll tell you about Ishtadev. Okay, okay, the next question. Next question. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter 6, Sri Krishna says, that after failing at his attempt to reach the goal of yoga, a practitioner starts his path again, striving harder than before. What is that makes him more enthusiastic? Is it some internal change that takes place, or is it some divine power? Is this also true in the daily life of the devotee? Um. I think what you're talking about is there's a verse in there that starts Nehavi Kramanashas di Pratyabhaya Navidyate. Uh, that's in the, it's in the uh, second chapter of the Gita. And, uh, it says in this, on this path, uh, nothing is ever lost and a li little endeavor goes a long way. The point being, <clears throat> whatever you do in Krishna consciousness is never lost. So sometimes the practitioner, you know, makes some progress and then is unable to progress for, for some reason, has to leave the path or takes a step back. But when he returns to the path, he returns with greater determination and makes more forward progress. Nehabi kramadashasti pratyavayanavite svapam apyasidharmasya so it says, Krishna says, uh, even a little progress on, on this path of dharma uh, will yield a great amount of uh, joy. Uh, whereas, 
don't worry that if you made some progress and you, you left, you'll never recuperate your progress. That's not true. When you come back, you'll find that, well, you took a step back, but now you're ready to take two steps forward. He says, try uh, machato bayat. And this knowledge will free you from the great fear. Knowing that uh, will dispel your fear. It's a little advancement on this path uh, will protect you from the greatest fear. Yeah, what else? Disturbance is unavoidable after a guru's departure. Which part of our spiritual life is most vulnerable to this? How to distinguish? Okay, the part that's most vulnerable in your spiritual life after the departure of the guru is your relationship with the other devotees. You have to be very careful about that. Read the question again. Yeah. How to distinguish between deviation and fresh current? I don't follow the last part. I can't the, hear you. The, this, distinguish between deviation and fresh current. Show me the text. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm having technical difficulties. It says, disturbance is unavoidable after a guru's departure. Yes. What part of our spiritual life is most vulnerable? The most vulnerable is the, is the, uh, the community of devotees and your sense of communion with them. Because if your leader goes, you think, well, then why do I have to listen to you? And why should I listen to you? Our leader is gone. When he was here, you were his friend, I was his friend, you were his friend. We were all friends. We had a family. But once the leader of the family goes, why should the family go on? Well, you have to find some reason to make that happen. How to distinguish between deviation and fresh current. I think what you mean by fresh current is a new interpretation, a new way of uh, a new way of um, expressing uh, our devotion, or a new way of organizing ourselves and continuing. Fresh current. Now, how do you know that that's not deviation? Well. The best check on any deviation is guru, sadhu, and shastra. So, in the absence of the guru, you have to try to find the guru somewhere else. Guru is Krishna. Sakshad dharit venasamasta shastra. Guru is Krishna. Guru is one. Right? So, if I'm in the marketplace and uh, I'm buying flowers, and I push some woman when I'm buying the flowers, the woman turns to me and says, you have to, you have to take care about your ego. You need to do something with that ego of yours, right? That's my guru talking to me. Looks like an old woman in the marketplace, but that's what my guru told me. So you have to refine your sensibilities so that you can, f you can see your guru uh, everywhere, even where you don't think he might be. Then also pay attention, pay attention to the books, right? If you read in here, you know, I don't know. I can't find a quick quote. If you, if you read in a book how you're supposed to behave, how you're supposed to act, and you see that's not being done. This is not what I'm seeing in my devotional community. Then you have to look for those people who are doing that thing that your guru gave to you and form a community with, with them. Uh, I was in a similar position after Prabhupada disappeared and I asked Guru, guru Maharaj, you know, he said, sometimes, he gave all these really very concrete examples. People often say Sri Dharmarsh was very theoretical, but his examples were very concrete. He said, Say you get on a train, right? And then you, you realize after a couple of stops that you're not going to your destination. You have to pay attention and see, well, wait a minute, where am I going? Is this the train I'm supposed to be on? 
And at some point, if it's not, you have to get off that train and find the right train, even if it's going in the opposite direction. I had that happen to me in Moscow. You know, you get on the metro and you're going one stop, two stops, and then suddenly you go, wait a minute, is this going to the university? No, uh-oh, I've got to get off and go back. It's inconvenient. We don't like to change course. But sometimes it's necessary. If you see the whole mission is off course, that's, that's a more desperate situation. But you try to find those devotees who you know and you love and you trust and you think, you know, they'll help me stay on the right course and maintain their association, right? Also, deviation. What does it mean? Does it mean that we're not correctly, uh, you know, following a kadashi or, you know, somebody discovered that some kind of Mangdal bean has been compared with meat somewhere because of its protein. And we found another devotee eating that. So we will criticize him. And you know, he's deviant. He's deviating from the Course. You know, we saw, you know, I don't know, Bhakta John Prabhu smoke a cigarette. You know, he's deviated. But then again, you know, nonsense is one thing, right? Stupidity is one thing. Sense gratification is one thing. But loyalty to your guru and the mission is something else entirely. So, if, if someone is loyal to uh, guru and, and the teachings and the line, but we see some nonsense in their character, sometimes that can be, cle that can be cleared up. It's a, it's a momentary... Oh, cancer that can be cut out, you know. But deviation from the line means I'm no longer a, a follower of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. I want to be a follower of a bogus line or a different line. Okay, that's good, but you're not in our line anymore. That's real deviation. I don't want to mention anybody because I don't want to express anger. So you, bogus gurus, you know who you are. Don't be bogus. <laughs> you know who you are. You're out there. We want to thank you all very much for uh, tuning in, taking the opportunity to uh, uh, sit here with us for a few minutes while I'm trying to share what I remember from Sri Maharaj and Prabhupada and their teachings. And uh, all of you are very generous to take a few minutes to tune in and listen. And we hope you continue listening to the programs of Theistic Media Studios. Godhead is light, nescience is darkness. Where there is light, there is no darkness. Thank you very much and Hare Krishna.